Um, but I think it's important for us to talk about English translations because it's one of the most common questions that get brought up in the church, whether it's uh, in this congregation or other congregations. What, what version does the preacher use? Does he use just one version? Is his version the same as my version? If it's not, why isn't it? And so... English translations and different versions, I think, help pique our interest. So I hope this class is uh, interesting for us and helps pique our interest at the different English translations and why that is. And so the first I would like to do, uh, Jack P. Lewis. Uh, you may have heard of Jack P. Lewis. Uh, he's one of the greatest scholars the uh, church has probably had, especially in recent times. Uh, Jack P. Lewis has a, a Ph.D. in both the Old Testament and New Testament, uh, one of which is from either he uh, Yale or Harvard, I forget which one, and the Old Testament is from uh, Hebrew Union, uh, the premier Jewish uh, university in the country. And so, extremely brilliant guy. He wrote a book called From KJV, King James Version to NIV, which was first published in the uh, early 80s, right after the NIV came out. It's about that thick. It's a, it's a wonderful book. If you're interested in getting like a really in-depth study on English translations, uh, Jack P. Lewis's book from KJV to NIV is fantastic. He, in fact, he was uh, actually on the translation committee uh, for the NIV when it first came out in 19, I believe it was 74. Uh, so uh, brilliant, brilliant individual. But he says this in his book towards the end on page 410. The one truth that stands out the most clearly in, is that translation, in the end, is a human process. It is not divinely inspired. The expectation of a perfect translation is a vain hope. Certainly none of the present translations even approach perfection. Yet despite the errors of man, the truths of God are to be found in God's book in translation. And I would agree with that. And I wanted to start our class off with that uh, quote. And I want to end our class on that quote whenever we get to our last class, which should be four weeks from now. Uh, but uh, what are some questions that you've heard or maybe that you've had about translations, whether it be English translations or anything? They all say the same thing. Do they all say the same thing? In different places. <laughs> okay, is that a question or a statement, Brother Charles? Question. A question. Do they all say the same thing? Okay. How do they differ? I think that's the most common question we have about English translations. Why do they differ or, or how do they differ and why? And so both of those are extremely important. What else? Okay. Uh, which translations have error in them? How much is too much? Um, how how do they differ like that? Okay. Good. Good. Uh, yes, for Rick. Okay. Why is it one enough? Why do we have to have so many translations? Why do we have to keep having updates or changes? Why can't we just have one and stick with it? Uh, I know I was talking to someone one time and he was talking about uh, growing up uh, for him, which would have been in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. And he said, one of the things that I miss is being able to, if everybody used the same translation, which at that time would have been the King James Version, and said, so, you know, it was, it was nice because uh, if you had memorized a verse and the preacher quoted that verse, you memorized what he was quoting. And so you could kind of quote along in your head. And he said, I really miss that. I like that. Uh, he said, you know, as a preacher, sometimes it was tough because if I misquoted a verse, you know, people in, the, people in the audience, you know, they knew it, right? And so he lamented over that fact, which I think is in line with what you're saying, Brother Rick, and um, kind of what he was ex ex expressing himself. Um, I see that point, but language is living, and it changes. If you think about language, it doesn't always mean what it says. Absolutely. Laura, Ms. Laura Bingham just said that one of the reasons why we need English translations to be changing is because our language is always evolving and changing. Uh, Ms. Laura, did you teach English in school? Okay. So, all right. So, spoken like a true English teacher. So, there you go. Um, yes, Brother Smith? Yeah. Right. 
Right. No, and, and that's, a, that's a valid question, a valid request, right? Uh, you don't want somebody to be preaching out of one that's completely different than yours because it's, it's really hard to follow. Uh, there's some pros and cons, right? If we're having a Bible class where we're maybe going through like First John or Hebrews, sometimes it might be nice to hear a different translation and see yours and ask, okay, raise your hand in class. Okay, verse 7, yours said this, mine says this. A little different. Can you, what's going on here? So it could cause some discussion. It could cause us to think about something in a new way, right? But if it's in the middle of a sermon and you're trying to flip and then you've got a preacher like me and, you know, you got to go from one to the other. You know, it can be hard sometimes. And so, absolutely. Um, any other questions or comments about English translations? I'd be interested in what you find to be scripturally wrong about this or that translation. Yeah. There are some of those. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, fantastic uh, statement, Brother Ed. You know, it would be interesting to study to go through and see where they got it wrong. You know, where where are some things in some translations that we need to be careful about, that we need to know uh, before we sit down and if someone has a certain translation. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of a, a story without giving too much away. Uh, I'm pretty lenient on English translations. I mean, I'm, I'm lenient and I'm not. To some people, I would be lenient. To some, I would be super non-lenient. We'll get that in class. You'll see. But I remember going back home uh, in Adams, and I was in college. And so I had uh, classes on the English Bible and, and had been exposed to lots of translations. And, and there was a girl. She was in high school. And it was a Wednesday night auditorium class. And we didn't have a high school class because the congregation was so small back home. And uh, the preacher asked for somebody to read out of a passage. It was a pretty well-known passage. And she read that passage, and I... She was behind me. I turned and I said, what translation is that? Because <laughs> even I was getting thrown for a loop over what, what was going on. And then she told me what it was. And I said, oh, that's why. And uh, so, yeah, so sometimes it's important to know um, where they differ. Uh, Brother uh, Jim. Um, the example you gave back um, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, leaving complete verses out. Yeah. Yeah, that's an important question. If you turn to this translation and you've got this verse in here, like just last week, right? Um, we had First uh, John uh, chapter, well, it was two, two Sundays ago. It was First John chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, right? The Johannine comma. You know, why, why, did, why did your verse say, you know, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, these three agree, and, and the version I use anymore didn't say that at all. You know, so why, why is it like that? Why do some versions have those in? Why do some have them as a footnote? Why do some leave them out completely? And so that's a big question. Um, any other questions? We're going to try to answer all of these to our class, but these are great because these kind of help me gear the class towards what you guys are interested in when it comes to translations. Ms. Renee. I think some people, especially that don't, are not religious people or not Christians, they use the argument that most Bible translations they think are twisted by humans or yeah. they have an agenda or this yeah. group created this one and this is why they created it and so they just think we're all wrong because we're following human words and that human words can be twisted. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, I think you're right. I think they see division um, a lot in Christianity uh, whether it's um, you know, with denominationalism or different versions or uh, whatever it might be. So that might be one more roadblock in that diversity, right? Um, diversity is a very popular word right now unless you're talking about uh, religion, right? We want to we ground it down into a, a single, right, a truth. And so I think that's important. Any other questions or comments? Excellent one so far. Yes, uh, Miss Lisa. Well, that's a good question, and I'm not going to answer that because that's like lesson three or four. <laughs> and I got I got to keep you coming back for more. You know, I got to, you know. Um, so, but good question. We're gonna we're gonna ask that question. I'm gonna give you Isaac's top five, and that way you can really hate me, like all of y'all. I will please no one, and so you'll all have that in common together. See, I'm building unity in the congregation. See, so um, so we'll, we'll have that later towards the end of class. I'll answer anything. <laughs> what about the Maxima Cato? I've seen some of those. Max Licato? Max Licato. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I didn't know he had his own verse. I know he writes a lot of stories and stuff, but I didn't know. Yeah, he's got a lot of books. Yeah. Yeah. He's got a he's got a lot, he's got a paraphrase about the Gospels, I think. Um, where he, um, I don't know what is, and they called him Savior or Lord or something like that. I think that's kind of like a paraphrase, um, but it's not really a version or a translation. It's more of like a, like a story, like a, a, a historical fiction, and so it's it's a little bit different than a translation. But but yeah, they, there's a few of those out there too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Max Cato, he's very popular. Um, he's got some things that concern me, but he's he's definitely very popular in the Christian world. Um, but moving on towards our class, wonderful uh, discussion so far. I think that has been more class discussion in one night than we've had the first six months I've been here. So uh, I was talking to Peyton that day. I was like, i got to get him talking more. I was like, I'm fucking getting tired of my voice. Um a good topic? Good, good. Well, hopefully we can keep this, to, this going. So if you have a question or comment, please uh, raise your hand or just, just say Isaac or Josh or whatever. You know, just, <laughs> just let me know you want to say something. That works for me. Later, Brother Austin. Uh, hey, guys, yes? Hey, this is a question to the elders. Uh, so you teach Bible study, but you don't teach Bible study. <laughs> Some years ago, before you got here, they asked if you were reading from the pulpit not to use a certain version. And I don't know what that is unless it's what she was saying, that New Living. Uh, I guess one of them can answer that because uh, I don't know what that was. Yeah. It wasn't New Living? I didn't think it was New Living. Some criticism on the NIV is that you were like that. Yeah. Yeah. So good, that's a good question, Jason, and the elders will get, will, may, might get back with you on that. <laughs> I have no authority to say. <laughs> New King James. Um, and that's, I think that's what our scripture readings are always from, right? For the Lord's Supper. And so uh, the new preacher, though, he, he came and messed that all up. So, sorry about that. I do appreciate the elders being, being uh, 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 understanding with me and, and my preferences. And, and they asked me if they cho- chose a particular translation, if I would preach from that. And I said I would have no problem and, and still don't. And so uh, um, we're... I, I was the reason we went to the New King James. Because when we started Bible Bowl, they used the King James. Yeah. And we wanted our kids to hear what we were studying. Yeah. And that's that's basically why this church went to the New King James. It wasn't because of us. Yeah. Yeah. Bible Bowl. I think it makes perfect sense. Do they use the New American Standard now? No, still New King James. New, still New King James? Not last Okay. Okay, that's last leaders. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the thing is that different different ones have different years. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, like the New King James you have in your hands is probably not the New King James you think it is. Uh, but we'll get into that later. We're gonna, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, the purpose and the need. Just like Miss Laura Bingham said, we need to have English translations because we're building a bridge. The thing that all of us want, we want to know God's Word. We want to know it in its truth, in its entirety, but there's a problem. You don't speak Hebrew, Aramaic, or Koine Greek. You may have trained yourself in some of those languages, uh, but you're not fluent enough in those three to read the entirety of God's Word uh, from the original manuscripts. And so we need to build a bridge from the first century world, whether we're talking about the New Testament or the 15th, 15th century B.C. world of the Pentateuch, for us to be able to read it and to understand it. And we're trying to, to build a bridge the best that we can. Uh, if we're going to build a road, right, we want that road to be the straightest road. We want it to be the most economical road. We want it to be the best road we possibly can. And so we're trying to build a bridge from our town to the town of the Bible. We're not just trying to get there haphazardly, right? We want to have a good, solid bridge that gets us so we can understand the most about that town. And that bridge is our translation of God's Word. And so we need that bridge, and we need that message in our language because, as mentioned beforehand, we don't speak those original languages. In fact, 
three of those original languages are dead. Um, Koine Greek is dead. Uh, Aramaic in the form of Jesus' day is dead. Hebrew was a dead language up until about 30 years ago when they, they reinvented it in Israel. Uh, when they created the Jewish state, they said, you know what, we're going to revive Hebrew. Now they spoke a version of it that was mostly Germanic. It was called, anybody know what it was called? Yiddish, right? It's mostly German, mixed in with a little Hebrew. But when they built the Jewish state, they said, you know what, we've got all these Hebrew uh, writings. We've got all these Hebrew scholars who have studied and, and know Hebrew because they've learned it from the Old Testament passages. They could read Hebrew in church. Uh, Clyde Woods went to Hebrew Union. He had studied Hebrew, and he said he got there with some Jewish guys. It's so weird because they had taught them how to read the Hebrew text as children, so they could turn to their Old Testament Bibles and read Hebrew without missing a lick. They had no idea what they were saying. They knew how to make the sounds and the word, but they, but they, couldn't, they couldn't speak it. Does that make sense? And so, up until 50 years ago, all three original languages of the, of the Bible were completely dead. And so, we need God's message in our language, or we're going to have to rely on somebody else to tell us what it means. Uh, I watched a documentary recently about Martin Luther. And uh, Martin Luther uh, was a very key figure in the Reformation. He uh, kind of, I don't know if he coined it, but he made it popular, sola scriptura, uh, only scripture, right? I don't want church councils. I don't want the Pope's advice. Only Scripture. And one of the things he would say is, a layman with Scripture is to be trusted more than a Pope without it. Uh, and so, if we're going to say that the, the God's message is divinely inspired, and that's what we've got to do, then it's important for us to have it in a language that we can understand. And as Miss Laura was saying, language is always changing. And therefore, we will always need new translations. Uh, the English that we speak today is not the same language, English of the 1950s. I mean, it's really not. Uh, the language that we speak today is vastly different than it was in the 1800s, the 1700s. Uh, if most of you picked up a legitimate 1611 King James Bible, you wouldn't be able to understand what you're reading. Most places you might could, but there's few places where you'd be completely lost. Um, and so language is always changing. And so because it's changing, we're trying to keep that bridge from our world to their world. And if we're going to have the best bridge possible, it's going to have to meet the needs of our language today. And so then we get to these early versions. And I think this is interesting because it shows us that this is not just an English problem. Uh, sometimes we think about this as far as, well, what is the best Bible? Well, the best Bible is a red Bible. You know, the best Bible is a Bible that's lived out. Because this is not just an English problem. Uh, yes, English up until, as of recently, the last 50 years, is the second most widely spoken language on earth. Right? Mandarin Chinese is actually the, 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 the most spoken language on earth by a lot. Right? But we come in second. But up until uh, 50 years ago, maybe, maybe 100 years ago with British colonial, colonialization, right, English was just a backwoods language that was spoken by very few people. Right? It wasn't only until recently it's become to prominence. And so this shows us that people have wrestled with translating God's word into their native tongue since the church began. Early versions reveal much about the missional activity of the early church. It demonstrates the history of the transmission of the text, and it provides commentary for us on how the, uh, the Word was transcribed early in the church's existence. People wanted the Bible in a language that they could understand and they could read, and that's the power of God's Word. Uh, sometimes we forget that we're not the only ones trying to ask this question, uh, how to get the Bible in my language. And so here we see here Syriac in the second century, the Diatessaron became extremely popular in the early church. A dia testeron is from two Greek words. Dia meaning through and uh, tes meaning for. And so it was pretty much like um, anybody got J.W. McGarvey's uh, Fourfold Gospel? Anybody got that book? Anybody know what, what the premise of that book is? What he does? It takes the four Gospels and puts it in one chronological narrative. Right? So you read one paragraph from Matthew, one paragraph from Mark, one paragraph from John. He's trying to lay it all out so it's one book and it's in a chronological order with all four Gospels in there. Does that make sense? Okay, J.W. McGarvey didn't invent that. The Diatessaron did in the 2nd century. Right? And so, extremely popular. We have it going to the Egyptian language in the 3rd century. Nubian, which was just south of Egypt in the 3rd and 6th century. Ethiopic, um, 
in the 4th century, Armenian, the 5th century. Uh, we had the second most manuscripts uh, of Armenian manuscripts, as we do of anything. Um, Georgian, which is a lot like Armenian. They're called twins. Uh, they look similar to Greek uh, letters. 3rd uh, century, there you have Arabic. Uh, Latin, the 3rd century. This would become the most popular form of communicating God's Word. Anybody know why? Catholic Church, right? Uh, I've got an uncle. Uh, when I went to Free Hardeman and I was getting a Greek minor, he said, why are you studying Greek? Why aren't you studying Latin? And uh, I said, well, he, the, the Bible is in Greek, like the original. And he had no idea because, that the original New Testament was in Greek uh, because he came from a Catholic background. And he just assumed because of how popular it was in the Catholic Church that Latin was what the Bible was written in originally, and that's not true. Uh, but we do see Latin manuscripts as early as the 3rd century, Gothic in the 4th, Sogdian. Now, if you, can get, if you can tell me who the Sogdians were, I'll get you a piece of candy. Anybody? Uh, Lacey's over on Google. <laughs> they were an Eastern Iranian kingdom that was very powerful, very big, about the 7th century. They were actually the last kingdom that owned the Silk Highway from China to the Middle East. Um, you know them now as Iranians. Uh, they were descendants of the Persians. Slavonic in the 8th century. Where's English? Somebody said in England. <laughs> You're right, sir, whoever that was. Um, the 14th and the 16th century. The 14th century, we've got the Wycliffe Bible that is published in 1388. It is the first complete English translation of the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament, but it was from the Latin. Uh, it was not from the original languages of Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. That's why we have 16th century. William Tyndale was the first person to translate the English Bible from the original languages. That took place in 1526. And um, both men had to pay a very, very dear price uh, for their work. We'll see that both uh, in our Sunday morning class. Um, but one, uh, one, of, one of them, his remains were dug up. They were burned and scattered, uh, so no one could, his family would ever know where, where he was. The other one was burned alive at the stake because he translated the Bible into English. And that was a cardinal sin of the Catholic Church at the time. And so, why so long for English? Why do we have to wait almost 1,300 years after the church is established before we get a translation of the Bible into English? Well, Latin was pushed by the Catholic Church. Uh, Latin was a language that was only spoken by the clergy. Um, Latin was not really a, a, a thriving language. It was almost encapsulated in um, Jerome's translation of the Vulgate. And so people couldn't understand what the Bible said because it was in Latin. Whenever the Bible was preached from the pulpits throughout Europe, it was preached in Latin. And so they didn't really have an idea of what they were saying. Few had the ability, the time, or the money. Before the time of the printing press in Gutenberg in the 1500s, for someone, even if, they, even if they didn't have to study Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, if they were just going to copy the Bible, like just going to sit the Bible right here and sit it right here and copy it, it would take years because it was painstakingly slow. It was extremely expensive because there just wasn't a mass production. I mean, uh, they wrote on animal skins. And so... If you wanted to write the Bible, you had to kill a lot of animals. I mean, that's a lot of vellum. And so it was an extremely expensive process to, uh, to, to uh, produce Bibles. Also, Bible and the local vernacular threatened the power of the Catholic Church. Um, I talked about uh, Martin Luther's quote, William Tyndale, when he was being persecuted uh, for writing the Bible in English, he said that his life's goal before he died was going to be so that the uh, farmer on the plow knew more Bible than the priest in the in the in the uh, city in the, in the in the city church, and so uh, and he did he accomplished that and much of what we know today of the English Bible we we you know um, I think eighty percent of the King James sixteen eleven is the William Tyndale Bible. Uh, we'll talk about that with the history of the English church, uh, but the King James owes much of what it did in 1611 to what William Tyndale did in 1526. And um, so that's, that's why it took so long. As we mentioned before, uh, the English language is always evolving. 
old English. We're not really sure much about the English language because it wasn't really written down that much. But we do know that in 1100 there was a shift from Old English to Middle English. Does anybody know why that shift took place? Maybe some of my English teachers. Something big happens in 1100 that completely changes English language. I mean completely changes the English language. Almost unrecognizable afterwards. I'll give you a hint. There's your hint. Nothing? All right. Anybody ever heard of the Vikings? All right. The Norse conquest? Okay. The Norse come in and they pretty much take over the entire British Isles. I mean, they, they take over pretty much everything. And one of their influences is the language. And then, of course, you have the French influence. And uh, so you have this, this French and Germanic influence along with mixed in with the Norse. And English completely changes in the Middle English, in, the, in that middle time frame. And then it changes, once again, what we consider to be modern English from 1500 into our present. But as you can see, there's been many movements and changes even in that modern English time period. And so as the English language evolves, just like... Um, Miss Laura was talking about. There's a wonderful Greek restaurant in Springfield, Tennessee. It's called Torino's. If you're ever in town, Robertson County, you should stop by. Uh, Saki is the guy who owns it. He's Greek. You can tell by looking at him. It's not a joke. I'm just saying. He, just, he looks like a Greek guy. Um, wonderful people. When I was in college, my dad or my mom was talking to Saki, and they said, yeah, Isaac's studying um, Greek. And he said, oh, really? You should send him by sometime so I can talk to him. And my aunt goes, well, it's like the Bible Greek. He goes, well, I don't know nothing about that now. And so it's the same thing. That's 2,000 years of change to a language, right? Koine Greek is not the same thing they speak over in Athens today. And so it's the same thing with us. Language is always evolving, and that's why we always are going to have to have a need for translations. The question was asked, why do we have to have so many translations? Well, there's a lot of answers to that question, Brother Rick, and everybody else who's thinking about that. Number one is money. Okay? Printing English Bibles. I mean, what's the number one selling book in, in the world? The Bible. So if you're a publisher, right, don't you want to get in on that? <laughs> yeah. You know, maybe you'll strike it rich. Maybe you'll put out one that's popular, and you'll make a lot of money. I mean, Thomas Nelson's made a lot of money printing Bibles. You know, so as so as other people who've been printing Bibles, and so number one is money. Um, number two is because there's a need, right? English language changes. Uh, you may not be happy with a particular translation over something, so you need something else. Um, one of the reasons why you have the ESV um, so soon after the NIV, the NIV came out. Um, then they had the NIV uh, change in '84, and then it changed again in 2001. And uh, some conservative, quote-unquote conservative Christians didn't like the NIV. And so they said, we need a new modern English translation that's going to be more literal than the NIV because we don't like the NIV. The product was the ESV. And so it's, 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 this, it's this, not a game, but I mean, you have people put out Bibles and people are like, we don't like that one. So if you're a publisher and everybody's saying, we don't like that Bible over there, what are you thinking? I'll make another one, but get money. Yes. Uh, okay, two thousand years in right. Yes. How many translations? How many different translations have, have we have, has the word gone through to bring it up to today? In the last two thousand years. Thousands. Pardon? Thousands. Really? Yeah. If we're are we talking about just English Bibles or or I'm all languages? Two thousand years ago. Greek. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, probably thousands, hundreds if not thousands. We'll see, and that's that's why we're having this class. Is because by the time we get done with this class, I want to do two things. I want to lessen your faith in translations. Now, hear me out. It'll become more clear towards the end of class. Okay. Um, and increase your faith in God's Word. Um, and I know that sounds paradoxical right now, but if you just if you follow me towards the end of the class, you'll I hope you'll see what I'm what I'm what I'm saying. Um, and what I'm trying to say is I'm not trying to say I want you to 
to decrease the faith that you have with the Bible in your hands. Um, uh, we'll, we'll get there in a minute. I realize that's part of the class. No, absolutely. And, but, but thankfully, so many people love God's Word. There are so many quote-unquote watchdogs out there. As soon as a new translation gets put out, there's already 15 websites telling you everything that's wrong with it. Uh, you know, whatever that translation might be. And so there are so many people who are trained in Hebrew or Greek or Aramaic who love God's Word, who want to know the truth. And so if somebody was going to do it maliciously, you would hear about it. I mean... You probably heard a sermon before about a certain translation. Right? I mean, it's, that's that's what happens. Oh, we we draw lines and say this is this is acceptable, this is unacceptable, right? And um, we'll talk about that more. Great great discussion so far. And so there are some constraints that we have with translations. That is the grammar of our ta target audience. We've got the original grammar of the Hebrew, the Greek, and the Aramaic. Uh, the correct meaning has to come through, right? Uh, words change. Um, what does the word nice mean? Kind, sweet. When the King James Version came out in 1611, it meant stupid. Right? If you say Bob's nice, it means something totally different today. What does naughty mean? They're naughty. They're bad, right? Right? 200 years ago, you would have given them a $5 bill because they don't have anything. They've, they're not. They've got not. Right? They got nothing. Right? It's changed. We serve an awful God. Boy, that sounds a lot different today than it did 150 years ago. Right? When awful meant awe-inspiring. Right? Today, I mean something totally different. So, not only do words change, they completely change our meaning. And so we've got to be sure the correct meaning is going to come through in our translations. And we've got to do it in the clearest way. And we also have to be sure that it sounds right in English. Right? Uh, John 2, Mary comes to Jesus and says, um, we're out of wine, we're out of grape juice, whatever you, whatever, however you, whatever you want to do to translate oinos, right, in John 2, we're out of it. Jesus says, literally, in Greek, what to you and me, woman? That's what Jesus says to his mom, what to you and me, woman? That's it. You translate that, into English, word for word. Jesus is going to sound like a jerk. Right? I mean, I didn't talk to my mom like that. Right? At least not without a slap, right? But that's not what Jesus means, right? He doesn't, say, he doesn't mean it like what we think of what to, me, what to you and me, woman. And so we have to be sure the naturalness comes through in the English. And that takes place with translation. And so we've got a few goals when it comes to our translation, and that is accuracy above everything, right? We want to know what God's Word entails accurately because the power is in the Word, right? So we've got to have that. It's got to be appropriate. It's got to have a naturalness to it, and it's got to have a form that is proper. And so that's our goals. D.A. Carson talked about there are four views of translations. One is the na naive view. Right? The naive view is that for every Greek word, there's an English word that is equivalent and encompasses the exact same meaning. Right? That's naive. That's not how language works. Is anybody in here bilingual? Brother Charles? Okay. All right, brother. All right. Right. I carry my big old Bible, but their Bible is about half this because Spanish words. You could take five words in English and put them into one in Spanish. Yeah. And, and, I, and I'm sitting there trying to go back and forth. And Karen said, what are you doing? And I'm trying to read. She's going to give me the English. <laughs> but they, all of the services are in Spanish down there. Right. And their translations, you know, if well, you've ever studied it, you will see. I mean, I sit there and compare them when I get back home. Yeah. And, you know. Five, six words in English will only go one word in Spanish because it means the same thing. Well, like Brother Charles is saying, if you've ever studied a different language, you realize is that the nuances of different languages don't always correlate one-to-one. -one. And so that's why we have to have uh, translators, translation committees. It's not 
as easy as just, well, let me just get a lexicon. Let me just get a Greek-English lexicon, and I'll just make my own translation. It's not how it works. And so um, we have to be sure that we're doing it the proper way. And there are some key terms I would like for us to understand. Um, and this is how we're going to clo close class. And I understand that we may have had some more questions that have been arised than answered. It's okay. This is a four-week class on both Sunday morning and Wednesday night. That's going to happen. Uh, if you have questions you'd like answered, please, please see me. We'll work those into the class. But there are some key terms, first of which is a literal translation. A literal translation is a translation that is trying to the best of their ability to express the exact meaning of the original text. Not all translations have this goal, right? Not every translation that is published has the goal of being the best representation of the exact meaning of the original, right? Um, paraphrases in of themselves do not have this goal, right? And if you say, well, I don't like your paraphrase because it doesn't read like my King James Version, they'd say, well, yeah, that's the point. We made it like that. And so when you're looking for something, raise your hand if you've ever read the preface to your Bible. All right? Some of you raising your hands, right? Some of you had, had Doug, right? For English Bible? Yeah, Sam's, Sam's shaking his head. If you've never read the preface to your English Bible, you've got homework for next week. Read it. It'll, it'll enlighten you about English translations. It'll, it'll make you ask some questions. A transliteration means that they're just rendering one letter to another letter. Uh, baptism is a transliteration of the Greek baptismos, right? Which means uh, baptism or to be baptized, baptizo in the, in the verb form. Um, a version is a translation from the original language to another. And back to your point, Brother Austin, when you asked me how many translations there were, translation or a version is a translation from the original text to the language. And when you asked me how many translations there were, I said hundreds or thousands. What I was saying to you is there have been hundreds or thousands of times where somebody has taken the original Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic and translated it to their language. Whether it was in the 2nd century Syriac, 3rd century Latin, 5th century Armenian, whether it was 7th century Sogdian, or whether it was the 14th century English. And that's what I was meaning. But every time we have a version, they're not translating it from the last English translation, if that makes sense. Like they're not, they're not going back and saying, well, I, I, I want to go back and change the translation that this guy did 15 years ago, and he did, he did his 15 years ago, and he did his 15 years ago, and he did his 15 years ago. Like it's not like that. That's not a, it's not a translation. Now that takes place, right? That's a revision. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, about different versions. I'm trying to give too much away, but we'll bring that up again. Paraphrase. A free translation or a restatement of the passage. A Reader's Digest Bible. Bruce Metzger. Um, there's been other ones that have, that have been done. These are paraphrase. An abridgment, right? A selection or condensation of a larger text. They're going to pick and choose. And so sometimes they print Bibles, you go to Dollar General or you go to McKay's or whatever, and you'll see an abridged Bible. And that means they've cut out the sections that they think are unimportant. Right? They've, or they've cut out the sections that they think are too cumbersome for daily reading. Right? They've made that decision for you. Some people find that very popular. Right? They want to turn to Matthew, they want to skip over the genealogies. They, just, they want to have something that's already been cut out for them. I'm not saying it's a good thing, but those things sell. Uh, and a commentary, which comments on or explains the text. And so, uh, there are types of translations, and this should be the last slide that we'll have um, today, tonight. Highly literal translations. Very literal. These are interlinears. Most of you have probably never seen an interlinear or don't have one in your library. Okay, They read just like the Greek, so when you open it up, the parts of the speech are everywhere. It's very hard to understand, but they're basically just trying to show you what it means word for word, placed down. Uh, it would be very cumbersome to read an interlinear Bible. And so we have a modified literal Bibles. This is the category that you'll find in our major literal translations. The King James, the New King James, the New American Standard, the New American Standard Update, the RSV, the NRSV, the ESV, the NIV. These would all be considered modified literal translations. Then you have the idiomatic, right? Which is a little bit... They're not a paraphrase, 
because they're doing it from the original translation and they're encompassing all of it. But these things, like, they're trying to interpret the text for you and then make its translation. And so you've got the New Living Translation or the CEV. I mean, if you've ever read the Romans 1 from the, from the New Living Translation versus read Romans 1 and any of these modified, you'll be like, what is going on? Like, this, is, this, don't, this sounds weird. Okay, because they're, they're doing things in there. The CEV, the Contemporary English Version, that was the version the girl was reading behind me in church. When I turned around and said, what, what was that out of? <laughs> so, these are idiomatic, right? Uh, you may say, why would anybody on earth want to have one of these translations? Well, some people, uh, they don't care about the literalness of the translation. They see the Bible as just a good book. And I just want to understand it for myself, and I want the, the easiest to read. And so we have those. And so that's what we have tonight. Are there any, any questions or comments from the material that we've discussed so far? I know there were several questions that were asked that we didn't get to tonight, but they're coming in the class. But if you have other questions or comments, anybody have those? If there's no other questions or comments, we're out of time, and we'll close the prayer. Dear God, we're so thankful for your word. We're so thankful for the men and the women who have uh, made it possible for us to be able to read your word in a language that we can understand. We're so thankful for the truths that we can find in that word, especially the salvation that we have through your son, as long as we are obedient to him. And dear Heavenly Father, please be with us and help us to love your word, to read it, to apply it to our lives, and to be sure that we're trying to bring other people to it. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.